Andy, I know you've never been happier than when you're sitting by a warm fire, snuggled up in a flannel and basking in the glow of an old school budget spreadsheet. (sighs) It is a special day I can shut down the world for a little me time. In a world full of applications, why do these antiquated documents and spreadsheets still run the world? And why haven't they been updated in over 50 years? That's why we want to talk about Coda. Coda is a new kind of doc that brings words, data, and teams together. It comes with a set of building blocks that anyone can combine to create a doc as powerful as an app. Coda runs our entire business here at True Story FM, from show scheduling across dozens of podcasts and scripts for thousands of episodes, to budgets and plans and wikis and more. Coda lets us see our business in a new light. If you'd like to shine a light on productivity in your business and save money along the way, check out Coda today at thenextreel.com slash Coda. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment, or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, The Hot Rock. And Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the Next Real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Okay, the, before we start, I want to make sure I say this because uh, I'm going to forget on the 26th, Friday the 26th, that's next week, Cloud Atlas opens. We've been talking about this for a long time, so we're going to be doing a film board. Uh, we're going to get everybody together. We're going to talk about uh, Cloud Atlas on the 27th, Saturday evening, uh, usual thing. Uh, I think we start around uh, 8.30. 
8, 8.30 uh, Pacific time. I'm going to say 8.30. We're going to start at 8.30 Pacific time. Uh, so if you can meet us, uh, join us for the Cloud Atlas discussion. We sure would love to uh, have you there. Now, what do you want to talk about? Frankenweenie. Frank and Vini. Did you Isn't that did how you see it? it? Did you see it by yourself? I know you saw it by yourself. You I raced did. out for a midnight show of Frank and Vini. All by my very own self. Did you really? You did not. Tell me you didn't. I did. No, I I took my kid, of course. I find your lack of wait. <laughs> I find your That's gonna stick. That's gonna a stick with you. Very... <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, yeah, so you, what did you think of uh, uh, Frank and Weenie? I thought it looked dumb. It, you know, Olivia was entertained. I mean, right. I, here are the things I like about it. What? I'll, I'll give you the, 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 my scale of justice, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the scale? Wow. A In little, a little proud of our rating system, aren't we? <laughs> 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 that's the new rating system it's the scale of justice you you have the two hands and the good goes in one side the bad goes in the other and you see where you come out <laughs> forget rotten tomatoes we got our own system over here it's much better <laughs> okay so they they did it all black and white which i really enjoyed and actually my daughter totally didn't even it didn't even phase her that it was all black and white so so that was nice <laughs> <laughs> so they've got that going for it. And by the time she's 15, you'll realize she's been colorblind all this time. <laughs> she loves black and white movies. That's right. That's uh, right. <laughs> so... <laughs> that's horrible. I shouldn't say that. Go ahead. Oh, you're terrible. Yeah. Thanks. Your Thanks friends. for that. Hey, hey, it's not my kid. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So. Anyway, mm -hmm. you were saying. <laughs> um, it, it had a lot of quirky stuff going on and a lot of references to old horror movies, interesting character design. You know, it's very Tim Burton-esque in that sense. And I enjoyed that element of it. Um, the story itself was kind of silly and, and the whole, they really, to me, seemed to have to stretch out the, the concept of how this dog how this boy was able to bring his dog back to life so that they could end up creating all these other monsters later in the film. And that was, for me, completely nonsensical. My daughter really enjoyed all the other monsters because they, I mean, the, the actual monsters themselves are fairly funny, but the, um, just the, the, the story work done by our friend, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name now, <laughs> old what's-his-name who wrote the script, uh, I'm not even looking it up. That's how much I really. I, I, God, <laughs> he's not my friend, and you have just totally made he's me. Sorry, big up. fish, big fish guy. Uh, why am I blanking? Oh on no, I do like him. Oh, well, yeah, man. that was the one movie that he did that was good. Remember John That's, August? Yeah, John August. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. That was, that was his one good movie, and I'd say I like I like that one movie and his blog. Uh, I don't like his blog. Ah, <sighs> you I and I are just not on the I, same page today. He's, he's a cranky man. He's grumpy and not fun to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Frank and Weenie, it's, you know, it's well designed, like every Tim Burton movie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and my daughter enjoyed it, so. Well, so, I am. I, I'm not sure where my scales of justice ended. I, I think. You know, looking at it versus sitting through and watching it all over again, I, I'd say that uh, the the scales of justice for me ended with the negatives being a little stronger than the positives. Okay, all right, that's fair. All right, what else did you see this week? You saw the one we were supposed to do. We were originally planning to do this as a film board. You saw uh, Argo. I did see Argo. Would it? Have, would it? It, it would have been worth doing a film board, wouldn't it? It would have been. It really would have been because it was a uh, just a fantastic film. Ben Affleck really is just <laughs> really a great director. I tell you, three for three, I'd say. So wow. um, well worth checking out. Solid performances all around. Good balance of the the kind of the uh, suspense political thriller with some of the uh, lighter comedic moments on the Hollywood side of things with Alan Arkin and Jod Goodman and. You know, just really, just a solid film right. in every way. So definitely check that out. 
Excellent. That, you know, it's high on the list. I did not see uh, Argo this week, nor did I see Seven Psychopaths, and I regret both of those. However, <laughs> man, I got full on Liamed this week. <laughs> I caught up on Taken 2, and how <laughs> that dude kills every damn thing in that movie. <laughs> he kills everything. Yeah. Everything that was once alive gets first beat up and then killed. <laughs> it was a lot of killing uh, and a lot of taking. And then in some cases, uh, the same person actually gets taken multiple times. And so there is room, I think, if you were going to, you know, do the math to actually you know, do that sort of complex calculus to get to to the number that it was, was actually taken, but it was a lot more than two <laughs> uh, of the taking. And he had a fantastic little cell phone that he kept in his sock, and that was another real highlight of the movie. So do you think that they in, they should have instead pulled a Teen Wolf 2, and they should have called it Taken 2, T-O-O? <laughs> T-O-O, yes! <laughs> oh, man, did you just make that joke up? I sure did. Oh, that's funny because it's so true. That's why it's funny because everybody also gets taken. That's why that's funny. <laughs> Liam gets taken this time, and that makes it even funnier because it's like, oh, that, the first one was my daughter was taken. She was just taken. This time, oh, I was taken, comma, two. There you go. Right? Ah, <laughs> oh, Andy. <sighs> Uh, every, it, yeah. So, uh, let me tell you. That, so, my impression of Liam Neeson, he's, you know, for he's, he's, uh, um, it's like watching my dad kick ass, right? <laughs> okay. Like wow. I, this is what I imagine my dad. He would look cool, and he would totally kick ass. And in like normal kind of, uh, he's just kind of awkward being a normal guy. Like, he is so good at kicking ass as kind of a dad that when he's having a barbecue and just trying to drink some beers, he looks really funny. Uh, <laughs> he's kind of hard to watch. It's sort of painful. Like, why are, why are you guys friends with this guy? Because he, he's not a lot of fun to be with. But, man, does he kill people well. That is funny. Yeah. So, anyway, that was, uh, it was, it, yeah, I can't, I, you know, in terms of the, the scale of the Mighty Hammer of Vengeance, uh, it, it was, you know. It was okay. Yeah. It was okay. I wish I had seen the other two movies even more as a result. But the other one that I saw this week uh, that I picked up uh, on the old rental box was The Thing 2011. Oh, yeah. So what was your thought on that? Yeah, it was weird. It was it was weird. Because they it was... I, I, I don't know how I, to characterize it. It was a prequel and a remake. Did you feel that way? It, yeah, it, it was kind of that way. It, it was really like was. the exact same movie. So is it a pre pre what would you call that? Pre pre cake? A pre make pre make pre pre make a make will make will make will. It was a make will requel. It was not uh, the the problem I had with it was that it it was not a bad movie. Like it was uh, if you kind of got rid of the fact that there was a the thing, uh, then I I. I don't really have a problem with it. It was it was pretty good, uh, but man, it's a movie that just didn't need to be made. Yeah, I think they did it already, and they did an admirable job of it. And frankly, the alien, which is sort of the you know what you tune in for, wasn't really worth it. Well, and I think a lot of that has to do with the 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 fact that it was digital effects rather than Rob Bottin's fantastic physical effects. Yeah, yeah. Personally, that's my opinion. But. They they tried to do the head thing upside down with the spider legs. They tried to make that a little bit better, but it just didn't. It didn't. It didn't take. Uh, yeah. I I did. Um, I I liked uh, what's her name, the main actress. Don't even, it was uh, I can't remember her name. Uh, but it was a, a a fine a fine take on a movie that didn't actually need to be made in the first place. So that was what I saw. Yeah, yeah. It's I, and then once you've seen it, it's kind of forgettable, and you can dismiss it, and not have to worry about using that in the the universe of the thing to put yourself into the the place of watching the 1982 version. Yeah, and you know, I I the, the on the my take on the the end was man, they just they just failed it. I that that part I thought in particular was really 
sad yeah. with the dog running across. I mean, the, the fact that I could actually cut these movies together pretty seamlessly um, made me sad. And, and it made me appreciate Prometheus even more. I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> as, it, as it turns out, I'm not a fan of the literal prequel. I l- right. prefer the thematic, I think. Well, and it's not just a literal prequel. I mean, it's, it's like literally knocking on the doorsteps, you know, from one scene to the next. Like you said, cut the two together and it's, yeah. it's one long film. Yeah. So that's yeah. Where, that was my take on the thing. Just to close that, to close that loop. And I also didn't, there's just a, a last thought on that. I didn't like that they just named it The Thing again. That bug, it bugs me the whole time. You know why it bugs me in particular? Because when I drop it in iTunes, it renames itself to The Thing Dash One dot M4V. <laughs> because there's already nice. a The Thing in there. It screws up my naming convention. It doesn't work. Uh, okay. Shall we move, so. shall we move on? Shall we? I'd like to. Let's. It gets up and kills. The people it kills get up and kill. <laughs> it's dead ish. Dot, dot com. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're still in our, it was, it's still Halloween month. Uh, we are thrilled to be uh, still in Halloween month. And we are continuing our uh, nearly endless series of uh, our favorite horror movies. And this is uh, my second favorite, uh, well, Second favorite this month, uh, zombie movie, uh, Dawn of the Dead, the 2004 Zack Snyder version of this film. Mm-hmm. So how do you want to start? This is your pick. You know, I, I, it's funny. I, it, so we're following up. So the first, uh, first was, uh, last week we did 28 Days Later. Right. And we, uh, we, I, I think the conversation was interesting as I went back and listened to it because of it just sort of uncovers for me all of the kind of wonderful cultural lessons that are buried in that movie. And and so I, I like it so much for what it is on many layers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, um, and and so when I I it may you could say it was a mistake that I <laughs> that we watch these movies back to back. Right. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that's fair. I am I am perfectly willing to open my eyes very wide and actually take in and and absorb what I'm seeing, because my my first reaction was I really still very much like uh, Dawn of the Dead 2004, uh, but I like it for what it is not. Right. Okay. You, you sort of have to to peel it back and realize that this is this is not so much uh, uh, a, a take on our uh sort of inner inner cultural uh uh motivations it is not uh it, it really is just a a bang up horror movie and right. uh and so it's if you stay on the surface uh it is a quite an enjoyable romp through a mall and it satisfies a lot of very um sort of uh juvenile desires that i have had and i think we've talked about one of them which is being locked in a mall or a big box store with roller skates overnight um and i wanted to do that very badly probably until 2004 when i saw this movie and realized that there, in fact i could be locked in there and surrounded by zombies that's right that's so, right i thought uh, you were going to say something much worse <laughs> <laughs> i was like what was what were you wanting to do in your no, childhood no what what are you what tell me <laughs> what you thought that was going to be because it, then i said we've talked about it before what have we talked about before that is worse than being no, locked you, in a mall you said you said one of which we've talked about before oh <laughs> There's a litany of other things I'd like to do that remind me of this movie. Is that yeah, what you're there's, saying? There's Burt Reynolds. <laughs> Pick him off. <laughs> oh, my. So, okay. So that that's my initial take on this movie. I still very much like it, and I enjoyed watching it, and there are parts of it that still spook me out. Uh, and I'm very, I'm very interested to hear kind of your take on it. Um, and, and I think in... Um, it, particularly in the context of where it is in Zack Snyder's uh, catalog. I find that interesting. So go ahead. What do you think? Yeah, it's, I mean, when when we were picking these, I, I was, I, I think, more surprised that you picked this rather than 28 Days Later. Wait, Only what? Because You're more excited? Donald really? Dead, I would have picked the 78 version. Okay, that's good. That That being said, I completely enjoy this film i think it's a a fantastic like you said romp through a mall (laughs) 
<laughs> it's it's a very fun, scary movie, and it's it it isn't really trying to do much more like the original one was. Um, but that being said, I mean, it still creeps me out. I mean, there's there's so many scenes in this that just are are disturbing and creepy, and they still make you jump. And I think Zack Snyder knows how to make a, a solid film from beginning to end, and I think he he nails it with this as his directorial debut. Uh, and I I really do enjoy this film, and I am glad that you picked it. It, it is fun to see right after Twenty Eight Days Later to watch this one and, and see that the zombie progress and how things had changed. But um, oddly enough, George Romero didn't like that at all. Well, that was, I was just going to say that. So that was one of those things that, um, you know, we had already sort, uh, you know, that, that, gosh, let's see. So when, it, when did 28 days later come out again? Uh, that was in, we was just talked about it. that two ish. Yeah, okay. That was two. That was right. Like, it was, was two thousand two. It was released no, in two thousand three. Two thousand two and two thousand three, and that was the movie. I I think we we decided that that changed the dynamic of the mindless zombie hordes being fast. Yeah. Because it was really George Romero that that capitalized on mindless zombie hordes being slow. Exactly. And uh, in this movie, I, I think that becomes more of an issue because we have Zack Snyder actually taking, uh, you know, IP from uh, Romero and changing a fundamental characteristic of the evildoer, right? The the, yeah. the giant zombie horde. Uh, that is, uh, I, I think if I, you know, if we look at what Romero was going for, it was the... Um, there is something really menacing about the slowness of it, right? And about yeah. the, as the virus starts to spread and it, it kind of leaves the slums, right? And the the kind of, it, it starts in that uh, kind of flop house uh, uh, giant apartment uh, in Dawn of the Dead, the 78 version. Uh, after the news station. Yeah, right yeah, after started, the news station the news falls station, apart. Right. Uh, and so we, you know, that <laughs> that's one of the... Uh, you know, really interesting things because you think, okay, there are those three zombies there and they really kind of have their run of the place and those police really should have moved faster. And so you're kind of left with that thought that the swarm mentality, no matter how slow it is, what is so terrifying uh, about the 78 Dawn of the Dead is that it is inescapable, right? right? And so Snyder's zombies... Uh, I think largely likely capitalizing on the 28 days later zombie evolution, uh, remove what was a key element of the terror in the first movie. Well, yeah. And, and another element that I think was key in the first movie is that it was the dead were coming to life. It was anyone who was like, I think it said recently deceased or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And I know that's kind of a, kind of a bit loosey goosey as far as determining who was actually going to be rising and who wasn't. But anyone, like if you die, it's of natural causes after that point, it's likely that in a few minutes you're going to open your eyes and, and become one of the walking dead. Right. Because as they, as they say, you know, when when hell the doors to hell are flooded or the whatever will, you know the, the dead, dead will walk, walk the earth, earth something yeah. like that and in this film they it's almost like they tried establishing rules for the, for the zombie creation and in some of that it's 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 like the midichlorians it kind of takes some of the the power exactly. out of it because all of a sudden it's like oh no it's the bite the bite's what does it and uh, so there's the one lady who gets killed in the gunfight and they're not worried about her coming back because she hadn't been bitten she just died in a gun gunfight right and it does kind of take some of that out and you know it's you know it, it i don't know in my mind that's uh, Zack snyder and his his team just kind of it it seemed like they really wanted to make a fun movie but they weren't so concerned about trying to do anything outside of just fun you you mean in terms of pushing the lore yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I, lore aside, right, I, but as far as 
creating a fun movie or creating something that's trying to say something about society, like the original Dawn of the Dead and talking about, you know, you know, people and it, all the scenes of the zombies just kind of walking through the malls and kind of creating this, yeah. this vision of, of, you know, what we have become as a society. Um, it, it's doing, it's saying something a little more. This one, it's not really trying to say anything. Like when you see them at the mall, it's not really saying anything. It's just, it's just kind of them in the mall. Y- yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Like there is no, um, no, I see what you mean. And I think that's another area where the, the 2004 movie falls apart. Um, in particular is, uh, the number of characters that we need to keep up with in the 78, you know, there were really four, right. That we cared about. And in, uh, in 2000, uh, 2004 in Snyder's version, there are like 27, that's a lot. They just keep this one. keep coming, and I, you know, who do we really care about? Ving Rhames and Mikai, baby. Those are the people we want to keep. Even Anna, the nurse, is somebody who could really, you know, she could go. I want Mikai Pfeiffer to stick around. I was upset when he when he had his problem. That was a good scene. That was yeah. pretty spooky. Uh, but but the uh, um, so it, there it was just a lot of sort of character confusion. I think that that makes that the the whole sort of mall experience less scary yeah yeah because you have you expand the characters so to such a number that by default you have to end up creating more caricature type of characters just so you can quickly establish who they are right you know and and in in some of that it loses some uh some power with right. us really feeling like we have a stake with any anyway. well that's an interesting point so talk talk more about the the sort of role of the caricature character and i'm I, you know i'm thinking in particular of of uh phil dunphy phil dunphy yeah you know he's, he's the modern anytime, family guy anytime you have a character that is um just brought on board to be a um, just kind of, you know, like I said, a caricature character. It's just somebody who is going to be like the typical character. Like I was thinking, um, uh, I believe it was, uh, uh, was it Ty Burrell, right? The, uh, the boat owner. Right, right. Ty Burrell. And he's, he's that, that's, uh, Phil Dunphy is his character on Modern Family. And I, he's become that. Mm. So, gotcha. gotcha. Uh, anyway, uh, Ty yeah, Burrell, that's but, right. But and his, um, yeah, he's just, he instantly is the arrogant, like rich business businessy sort of executive type of guy and he plays that arrogance every scene that he's in and it's funny and it works and it makes you laugh and you don't like him and you can't wait to see Anna the nurse uh you know plug him with a right. bullet at the end but there's nothing more to him than that there's nothing you know, even mm-hmm. when we see the shots of him at the end, it's only to est- in the in the videotapes they find on his boat. It's only to establish more of what sort of caricature they're pulling, and it it just I mean it's fun and it works. But after multiple viewings, you lose interest in that character because he is just a cardboard cutout. He's he's a stock character that we've all seen a million times in a million other movies, right. and it's just not as fun to watch. And so. That's why the original, you have a lot more interesting stuff going on with the couple and their relationship, and she's pregnant, and and the tension between the different characters, and it, it creates a much more interesting story among those characters and their life in the mall and everything like that. Here we have so many characters that it's it's just, you lose track of them. It is, it, it, you know, to that point of Ty Burrell's role, and I think, you know, to some extent, the, uh, yeah, man, is it... Uh, uh, what's her name? The blonde Monica, Kim, Kim Poirier. Um, she, you know, when they introduce that second round from the truck, uh, yeah. they, they introduce more of those sort of, uh, you know, those, um, um, sort of, uh, God, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah. You, you know, those sort of off the charts kind of caricatures and, uh, in fact, I think that detracts from your ability to see what the underlying story really is. And there is an interesting underlying story here that is different from, um, you know, the the nature of the slow kind of swarm. It, it is there. There is something to being trapped in a mall as the last of the civilization. And I think that's one of those things that 28 Days sort of capitalizes on the small cast uh, and their experiences just going from being trapped to being trapped. And 
here we have, you know, this opportunity to see, to kind of play with uh, as as a, a thought experiment, what it's like to have these people trapped in this space and in their security over the course of the month that they're in the mall together, you know, sort of they, they feel sort of safe and, and they're fine. They're taken care of. All the gates are down. They have enough food for the time being. And yet at the same time, the threat continues to grow outside. And, and I think that it just gets so, the, the cast just gets so cumbersome over the course of, of, uh, you know, that sort of 45 minutes that that plays out, uh, that it's hard to feel the sense of, of impending doom that is rising every time they cut to the roof. Uh, and, and you see just how many more zombies are out there than there were before. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, I just, I feel like I'm, yeah, I'm vamping no, a little no, bit. It totally, it totally makes sense. Yeah. The, uh, and it's those moments that you do start latching onto. And honestly, the characters that you most latch onto are the original characters that right. we meet. Anna, the nurse, Kenneth, uh, the cop, um, Michael, the Best Buy TV salesman, Andre, Mickey Pfeiffer's char- or Mikai, Mikai Pfeiffer's character, um, and, um, the, uh, and Andy, yeah. the, uh, the guy on the roof across the way. For me, those are the characters that, oh, and then I should say, um, Ina Korob- Korobkina, yes. the, the Russian wife. Um, I, I think the relationship between her and Mikai is a very interesting relationship. And those are the characters I latch on to. They have a little more depth going on, and I kind of like what's going on there. I'm interested in those people more. And if you left it with just those characters and you didn't throw in all these other characters, including the security guards, I mean, again, I, I feel like it's it, there's, it creates some interesting tension there, but... It also just kind of detracts from us being able to focus on those main characters. The tension is so short-lived. Like, you just run, it runs its course in the elevator when we meet them. At the end of that, you want them to just get back to, you know, figuring out how to live together. And I think it just adds an extra layer of kind of complication or complexity to the the, the evolving relationships that may have been unnecessary. Yeah. Um. But if, at least for my enjoyment. But I think you're spot on with that relationship with Andy. I think we have an interesting relationship with Andy as the viewers uh, because we don't hear him speak for so long. And when we do hear him, it's uh, it's really his last words. Yeah, which is it's horribly tragic. It really is. It is really tragic. I think they did, that was just great because they, you know, what they allow us to do is just build such a close relationship with him uh, to see just how alone he is and and never get any of his perspective, any of his POV. Um, that uh, you know, when you see him smashing himself up against the door as he's trying to get into the closet for that first time, close up, yeah. and they have to kill him. It's it it is made that much more kind of real so to speak. Yeah, and that's, I think, one of the only moments, if not the only moment, where we really have to kill a character that we've kind of connected with who is turned, other than the wife, I guess, the the Russian wife in bed, um, you know, which it, it, it is its own scene, but I think that one plays in a much more disturbing way. But the mm-hmm. one with Andy is just a rough one because we've been with that guy, you know, we've been rooting for him to make it, and then we find out he gets bit, and it's just, it's so tragic. I would add to that the death of uh, Luis Ferreira. Um, Luis oh, yeah. Ferreira, Well, right? he, we don't ever see him die. Oh, yeah, we see him zombie. Well, we, we, see him, we see him die, I guess, but we don't see him die. Yeah, that's true. Okay. All right. I mean, seriously, I, that we, we have to talk about that opening sequence, right? Yeah. That opening sequence, I think, is one of the most most exhilarating, powerful chases, like terrifying chases uh, uh, that that I've, I've seen in these movies because it happens so fast. First of all, yeah. it's a violation of a child by a, you know, and sort of by a child. Right. Yeah. Uh, when the, the the little girl is standing in the doorway, they've all there. She's just waking up slowly. And the little girl, I mean, what is she? Eight, seven, ten, like ten, ten ish. I mean, she's, I don't know, probably no Seven. older than your daughter. No, she's older than <laughs> yeah. Goodness gracious. <laughs> they can turn at any dime. <laughs> I'm just saying, watch out. That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and so she. That's, a, that's okay. She's, she's tied up in her bedroom right now. <laughs> she's not going to get me tonight. 
All right, and Child Protective Services <laughs> will be heading to... <laughs> <On> that note. <laughs> uh, okay, the, so uh, that's all right. You're, I mean, you're... CPS a, knocking at my door tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> you're, in, you're in Arizona. There's like prisons on every corner. You'll still be in the neighborhood. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> no, it's terrible. Uh, so here's the thing. Uh, uh, they, she, this little girl, it turns out, has been turned and also has no lips. <laughs> And she attacks uh, Lewis, the husband, uh, and man, she goes to town on his neck, goes to town. And that is one of the innovations, I think, that they really highlight, that we should really highlight, is the stretchy skin, uh, the stretchy, biteable skin in this movie is incredible. When, when uh, you know, that first bite in the 1978 version is like biting styrofoam. Uh, it's just not as stretchy. They did a great job in this movie. Yeah, it's uh, it's um it's good and gooey. And, it's so yeah, good. It's it's glorious stuff. And and the but, um yeah, Luke, they, and they and they don't hold back. You get no. great effects all the way through. When the girl was chews down on Lewis, it, it is one of the the. I mean, his. I think he plays being attacked like this so well. And when he turns after he sort of bleeds out, and then he comes back and turns, he is crazy scary. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and I think they establish it even just before that when. When Anna wakes up and she sees what the girl's doing and knocks her down the hallway, yeah, and see the girl like leap up to her feet, yes, completely in an inhuman way and charge her right there between yeah. that and then when Lewis turns, we know that this is a different zombie movie. Yes, that is absolutely, absolutely right. And uh, and so you know they it, then she she <laughs> she locks herself in the bathroom and what does she do? She backs up. Too fast, slips on the mat, and falls down into the porcelain bathtub. <laughs> I have not seen anyone take a hit to the back of the net like that and and not be just totally knocked out. That was crazy. She's tough. She's so tough. Yeah, that had so, to be that had to be uh, something. Uh, like that. And so then anyway. then we have the little shining moment there, and I think that's that yeah. for me is the when he comes the real the door. scary moment with him because just the way he looks and the way he's reaching through the door is yeah. just his eyes and he comes out with his both hands he comes right through the middle of the door uh and it, it, he's he's frenetic and terrifying and covered in blood and uh, uh and and i think that's one of the things that i like so much about this scene is that it, one of the pieces that's so terrifying about it is that it it turns on a dime they are spooning in bed and then he's trying to eat her and it happens within about 15 seconds right i mean not quite 15 seconds, maybe a minute. It happens so fast uh, that their relationship is over and uh, and she is having to to throw herself out the window. Yeah. It's, and it's and then she throws herself out the window and it doesn't let up. No, no. She finally gets into the car after seeing, and that's another thing that I like so much about this movie, when she walks out and looks at her suburban neighborhood and it's in complete disarray. Uh, people are chasing each other. They... they well, the Arguably. neighbor across the street's threatening to kill her. Right, right. Well, actually, I shouldn't say threatening. He is about to he's kill about her. He's about to kill her when and he's only hit by the by the luck by of the grace of God, I guess you could say, that an ambulance runs him over. <laughs> Does she escape? <laughs> so she gets out, and then Lewis comes chasing again. He finds yeah. his way out of the house and chases her down the street until brilliantly distracted like a dog uh, and and runs off and eats somebody else. Somebody who's walked out with yeah. his coffee in his robe to right. get his paper. <laughs> right. Uh, so there are a lot of those little moments, and that's a that's one of those great little little tiny moments. And then as she's driving away, I think there there's you know you get some of the they they do the helicopter shot tracking shot right, and um, they're they're tracking her on this road, and you get to see you know all of the ancillary kind of activities that are going on around her. And there is a scene where you know a, a truck comes barreling through an intersection right in front of her, and it's so small, it's so small, it's so small, and you think you know this is going to be a horrible huge explosion and it's going to cut right down into this explosion but it's almost made so much the better when it doesn't and that little truck just keeps going they never cut away they never take their their uh you know they never take focus off of her car on this road her little corolla and yet that truck goes into slams into the gas station and there is that giant explosion but it's really really tiny because you're so yeah. far away from it i think that's such a nice touch uh that that um uh, it, you know, it gives us, uh, us that experience of kind of visual contrast that I like so much, where we've been close up to the to the horror of the zombie 
you know, transformation. And now we just get to see kind of the overview, uh, the little diorama view. Yeah. That's really it, great. It works. It works really well. And, and it does put you in context of the devastation everywhere mm -hmm. um, in a way uh, different than the news because we see plenty of news as well, like all the news footage going on. I'm always amazed how the news, if any, if this movie is trying to really talk about anything, it's the addiction to media we have and how even the media people are so addicted to making sure they keep <laughs> telling the news that they're right there to the bitter end as, as the newscasters are being attacked by zombies. <laughs> well, that's a funny, uh, that's a funny thing you mentioned that because I have here in my notes how, what a funny contrast it is that we hear on the news that is on the radio and on the television all around Anna before she's attacked by her husband. Yeah. Uh, we hear all those little clips of them describing what's going on in the world, that there's something happening, right? Well, even when she's at work, it's already right? happening. It's already happening. So it's going on around her, and yet she is totally ignorant of it, right? She, she's Sean. She's Sean. That's exactly right. And yet when it finally happens and it's happening all around them, all they can do is sit in the mall and watch TV. Those the the you know the security guards are a great example because now there are zombies outside. They can look outside and see what's going on and yet they have to they're they have to sit and stare at the TV to get, you know, the television camera view of it, which I think is fascinating. It is. It yeah. really is. Uh okay. Um so, so what else? Well, I guess we should talk about uh, one one other actor. We've we've kind of run through a, a number of yeah. them, but somebody else that I think is just great in his one scene, even though it is another character character, is Matt Frewer, who I just love oh. as the loving father yeah. caricature. He's yeah. he's he's just always great. He's always going to be Max Headroom, but gosh, he, I just love his moment here, even though he totally looks like a zombie. Before he turns and becomes a zombie, he was he was made for this movie. He really was. I actually would love to have seen him just running around as a zombie. <laughs> He's an interesting guy, and and I think he he brings. Uh, it, it's funny that it, you know it takes probably forty minutes into the film for the for the heart to arrive, and that's the relationship between Frank and his and his daughter uh, as they and and that is the. Um, you know, that's when they, they realize what is going on and Anna comes to terms with the bites and that, that's where they introduce the, the zombie lore that, uh, you know, if you're bit, uh, if you get bit, you, you get zombied. Yeah. Um, and, and so he is the one where they say, you know, we're going to, you got bit, so we're going to have to kill you. Uh, and, and so you get to see their goodbye. Yeah. The goodbye between the father and, and daughter, which I, I think you're right. He's great. So talk talk about Mikai Pfeiffer though. Or did you want to say something else about? No, no, no. I, I I just think he's fantastic. I, I really enjoy him in this role. As small as it is, it's just great. The uh, the one you were going to talk about though was the um, the birth. Yeah, you know. Okay, so this is a really interesting scene, and I I think what I like about it so much is it creates a fascinating psychological study of a man who is dealing with a pregnant wife who happens to have also been bit and the psychology of him as he tries to deal with how, how, how to handle that, you know, and he, when, when we come back later in the film and we haven't seen his wife for a while and we finally follow him after he gets a, a her a coffee and he goes into the little nursery store that he, they've kind of set up shop in and he goes in and we see that his wife is full on zombie now and he has her strapped down to the bed. And she, I guess she's not full on zombie yet, but she's she's so close to being zombie. She's like almost zombie. And she he has her completely strapped down so that he can help the baby be born even though he knows his wife is going to turn into a zombie. It's It's horrifying. It's just a horrifying thing. But it's such an interesting psychological study of a character who's who is in love and is dealing with, you know, becoming a father and all this. And I, I find that one of the most fascinating relationships in this film. And I it, I think that is a really strong element that we didn't have uh, that we did have a woman pregnant in the in the last film, but not in the context of also a zombie. And I, I found that so fascinating in this. And I, I really 
I enjoyed that. I enjoyed what they did with that. I did too. And, and, uh, you know, then they, you know, they take it that, that next step, you know, <laughs> all of the, take the next they, step, they really is, take it, to which the... is horrifying. And it's interesting because even a father who has a zombie baby, because his wife dies and, or becomes the zombie, the baby is born and it's a zombie baby. And yet he still is, has it wrapped in its swaddling cloths and is, is, <laughs> is holding it. And, uh, you know, it's a proud father. It's it's really, and even kills to protect his wife and baby. He kills not a, only a, does he kill, a, yeah, he kills non zombie. Kills an right. actual regular person. He kills a normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a that that was a uh, that's a tough scene. That little baby. That's <laughs> tough. It's pretty creepy. It's pretty creepy. They should have totally done an ultrasound. <laughs> they can they can find that stuff out in utero. Don't they sell that down at the Panasonic stores <laughs> at home? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, that was uh, yeah that was good. So the, the, let's see what are the other uh, the other moments for me the big moments were the opening uh, attack by the little girl the the birth scene absolutely. Um, the other one for me I mean there's lots of great mm-hmm. scenes uh, and actually I think the one that terrifies me the most is the parking garage walking yes. through it in the dark yep that just that to me no matter what always is creepy because that zombie who has no legs but is swinging from the rafters aside from the fact that i always wonder well how did he get up there because <laughs> if he has no legs he can't climb to the rafters right that aside it's just so terrifying it's creepy the idea of being stuck in a parking garage in the dark and having zombies chasing you. Yeah, that was that was a spooky one. And I think what they, you know, as soon as he brings out the the, uh, you know, the gas pump, uh, you realize they're. I mean, they're just trapped. You can start to see all of them in the in the dark that are just sort of coming out of the dark. It's just a, a uh, really uh, well executed uh, sequence. Yeah, yeah. The other one for me is when they escape the mall. And, uh, you know, they're kind of forced to escape the mall Mm -hmm. and they get in their reinforced, um, you know, uh, mall buses, mall buses. (laughs) And we cut to that wide shot as they're driving out of the mall and we see these vans surrounded by zombies. And you just see the the buses going so slowly because they're they can only go so fast as they basically plow people over, plow zombies over. And you see them kind of rocking up and down, and you know that they're just driving over bodies. And it's it's a really disturbing scene when you realize how horribly trapped people would be in a real situation like this. Like, even in a reinforced vehicle that can go, you know, they, they break out of that gate to the parking garage, I don't know, going maybe 40, 50 miles an hour or something like that, yet... Even with that, they hit that crowd of zombies and they're slowed down to like a mile an hour, if that. And it's terrifying. I mean, that to me is just, it's the terrifying reality of what it probably would really be like if there happened to be a real zombie apocalypse. Yeah, I think that that gets back to the 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 Romero the aesthetic of sort of zombie aesthetic, right? Hmm. That, um, you know, what's really scary are these things in numbers and it turns out no matter how they are individually as soon as you get them in a crowd they're just as slow right they can't yeah. they can't move all they can do is uh sort of um uh just just sort of uh what's the word when you what the what 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 a, a desiccate whatever they're on top of you know and you get right, the feeling right. that as as these waves the sort of concentric waves of zombies are, are piling up on those buses that that's what we've been scared of uh all along right and now we put the 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 cast has sort of put themselves in this situation where you know they're they're going to be uh taken uh, you know and just um uh, taken over yeah, uh, uh, I love the explosion. I think the explosion makes a great effect, and I think again that that wide shot from above when the when the gas can goes up and you see the wave come out from the center, yeah, uh, is really great. Yeah, it uh, really is. Yeah, uh, and then uh, you know the ride to the boat, right? Yeah, getting all the way to the boat, and and the the interesting, you know, I, I guess you could say it's you know a, a bittersweet happy ending at the end 
until the credits start rolling. <laughs> <laughs> And then you realize, oh, there was really oh. no hope to begin with. Movie's no <laughs> over, not not over, and everybody's still dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so, a... but it's you know, it's fun, and that's I think what makes this film work is because Zack Snyder is a fun filmmaker. He okay. may not be trying to say anything important, but damn if he doesn't know how to make a fun movie. But here's I mean, the thing. Yeah. Can you do you really think that he wasn't saying anything important in the movies that come after? No, I, I'm talking specifically about this movie. Yeah, no, I mean, no, I'm with you. Okay, um, I'm trying to think what uh, what was the very next film that he did 300. after this? It wasn't Watchmen, no, was it? Three, it? 300. Was it? No, it was 300. Oh, it was 300, right, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't think he was trying to say anything with that. Watchmen, I think he was, but I don't know if he was so much as he did. the original authors right. of the graphic novel. Right. Well, and that's the I think that's the thing. Right. I don't think he was with 300. I don't think he necessarily was with Watchmen, but he did like the films ended up being more substantial in tone and tenor than than uh, Dawn of the Dead and different in style. And that's one of the things I found so interesting. Right. I mean, his the first movie, Dawn of the Dead, Universal Pictures. 300 three years later and his style as a filmmaker is dramatically different from 300 watchmen legend of the guardians and sucker punch uh are are dramatically different in tone and style than dawn of the dead yeah right i mean i just find that really interesting as a first film it it you could it would be difficult i think to watch this film and say that's a that's a Zack snyder movie and it's hard not to do that when you watch you know watchmen and sucker punch yeah, all of which I I liked very much. I haven't actually seen Legends of the Legend of the Guardians, but uh, it's on the I, list. I liked Legend of the Guardians. I haven't seen Sucker Punch. Oh yeah, I thought Sucker Punch was terrific. It was really? not at all the movie I expected it to be from the trailer. I'm not even close. It was great, 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 great. Yeah, that you're the only person I've heard who said that. <laughs> I know, I know. It's it's high on my list. Uh, and then, of course, the next movies after that uh, in 2013 coming out, The Man of Steel, he is directing, did not write or produce. And then he is writing and producing 300 Rise of an Empire. Yeah. Uh, but not directing. Uh, that was the thing that I found most interesting about Zack Snyder in this movie. It's a great you're, you're absolutely right. It's a great fun uh, movie with a lot of really solid gore. Uh, lots of great uh, dismemberment uh, with Chainsaw. Yeah, some terrific, just downright vivisection with Chainsaw on the on the the bus. That's a that I'm I I think it's one of those things for me, like sharp objects on moving vehicles. I have trouble with that. You know, I will say something about the effects. Um, they uh, almost in every case, at least as far as like when they were talking about it. They were using real effects on set. They were not using digital effects. So when that chainsaw goes down into her yeah. and cuts her nearly in half, that is all with a puppet that they created. When when the buses are driving over, like when that when the um, the BP truck, which actually is a, a nice little homage to the original, mm -hmm. is is driving up to the door and it's driving through the parking lot, plowing people over. Those are all dummies out there. And what they did is they actually used a motion control camera to get a shot of the people walking. Right. And then they did it again and they put dummies in there. So when it hit them, they could cut right to the shot of the dummy and they could match it up so that it looked like it was it was actually taking out the real people. But it's all real effects. Even when they blow the head off of Andy, when when Kenneth blows the head off of Andy, that was all with a, a puppet and a giant head. And again, it just goes back to effects looking, you know, having something special. As as gory as they are, there's something really special about them when it's not just digital effects. Right. Well, and I think even still you have to, I mean, in 2004, there was still a, there, there was very much more a, a choice, right, to yeah. be made between practical and digital effects. And I think we're seeing less and less of the choice as the years go on. I think there's always going to be a choice, though. It's just, you know, it, it, is it the ease of, of, of just doing digital and doing it later? 
or be uh, or using it because you want it to be as exact as you can, like David Fincher, who has sworn right. off ever using real squibs again because he can plan out every drop of blood going in every direction with any any gunshot wound. But but see, that's or, the point, right? Is that it, what he can achieve now, he could not have achieved in 2004. It makes it more of a choice back then where you actually say, do I want to be part of pushing the, the thing forward knowing that the effect won't be as good? Yeah. Uh, which, you know, would have been a Fincher kind of choice, likely. Or, you know, Zack Snyder going for the, the throwback of just the perfection of the practical effects. Yeah. I'd like to think, I'd like in my heart to believe that there are going to still be people out there doing some practical effects in in the continuing years. And it's not going to be something like film versus uh, digital that is eventually going to die. We'll see. We'll see I don't know, where man. things go. Even Newsweek went all digital this week. No more practical Newsweek. Really? Yeah. Interesting. See how I did that? I made a comparison between mass media and movie effects. It was beautiful. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so this movie, uh, like the first one, uh, was a modest budget, did pretty darn well in the box office. Yeah, I see that it cost uh, twenty eight million dollars to to make, and uh, it, yeah, it, you know, actually, I see twenty eight million total budget, fifty five million. So once you add all the yeah the uh, prints and advertising in there, and then worldwide gross, I see uh, just over one hundred and two million. Interestingly, I was reading about um, zombie movies in the box office, and very few of them ever break the hundred million dollar mark. Yeah, worldwide. Only the Resident Evil franchise has. And with the first one, the second one, the third one, I don't have any information on the fourth one. Um, 28 Days Later did not. It got to about almost 83 million. And then Dawn of the Dead broke it and Zombieland. And that's it. Not a lot of zombie films actually break $100 million. Zombieland had big, uh, big names. And it was a zombie comedy, and it was great. It, it was just a great movie with a lot of wit and d different audience. Yeah. Um, Resident Evil. Yeah. yeah there you it's it's a video game video game movie. You know. Really, Doom. Please. No. <laughs> what kind of a, what kind of case are you possibly making with that argument? I don't know what kind of case. <laughs> <laughs> Trump. Uh, uh, I'm sure there's a there's a case to be made, but clearly I'm not the one to make it. Uh, I mean, I've seen I've seen like three of them. I think Resident Evil movies, but yeah. I honestly couldn't tell you the difference between any of those three. <laughs> I you know I they're they're I, they're snack movies for me. I have them all, and I I admit I I sometimes I need me a little Mila, and when I need a little Mila, I put on the Resident Evil because she kicks ass in that movie yes she does she, she does, does. She does anyway uh so that i find that really interesting now if you look at the uh 1978 just in terms of scale of perspective here's what i have found and you correct me if you have something better budget of half a million box office 55 million yeah i i see budget of 1.5 million but uh, either way yeah that's a that's a, a stunning sort of performance for a movie and 1978 uh, a horror movie like this though so that's you know Romero was yeah. really one of the kind of pioneers of uh, you know him and John Russo when they did uh, the original Night of the Living Dead mm -hmm. uh, were kind of pioneering that independent horror filmmaking back then and uh, you know it worked quite well for them and and uh, they split up before Dawn of the Dead but um, Romero still used that and even with 1.5 million he knew how to make a solid horror yeah. film that uh, made with a ton lot of money of, with a lot of people yeah uh, so in, in that movie that was a it was a a lot of extras in that movie yes in there 1978. were 1978 um, overall a good movie I think it's a, of the series uh, this month it's I think it's we've we've reached the uh, the lightest of the lightweights of our horror movies mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very excited about next week yeah, me too. The Descent is a, just a great film. Very much looking forward to uh, talking about that one next yeah. week. It's a fascinating and creepy cave 
a spelunking movie, and I just love it. Just a lot of really Very interesting things. Very claustrophobic. Very claustrophobic, and uh, and uh, uh, it's well, we're going to talk about it next week. Very excited about it. Um, where can uh, are you are you finished? I, I I'm done. Oh, oh, you know what? There's one other interesting little tidbit of information that I, I found. I was watching the uh, the movie, and I saw in the credits. Sure enough, that uh, Heather Langenkamp was in the credits. I'm like, that can't <gasps> be Heather Langenkamp. Nightmare Where? on Elm Street, Heather Where Langenkamp. Where was she? What was she in this movie? She was like a makeup artist or something. What? <laughs> I know. I had no idea, but she's kind of left the world of acting, uh, which she really hasn't done much um, you know, in, in years. And, and she's just done other random things. Like she was, she did special makeup on uh, cabin in the woods and Evan almighty and Cinderella man. So she was one of the prosthetics production crew on Dawn of the dead. She and her husband own AFX studio, special effects, makeup studio in LA years ago. She created and ran the Malibu gum factory now closed, which sold chewing gum packaged with trading cards depicting go, go ahead. Guess what they were depicting. Go ahead. Pick anything. Uh, what would you like to see on a trading card in LA? Uh, uh, in LA, uh-huh. I'd like to see famous LA landmarks. Nope, you're wrong. Give you one more shot. Uh, stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Local surfers. <laughs> there you Chewing go. Chewing gum packaged with trading cards depicting local surfers. Uh, wow. Many elements of the plot for Wes Craven's new nightmare are based on an incident in which Langenkamp was stalked by a fan. That's too bad. <laughs> you don't like that stalking stuff. Heather Langenkamp, man. Yeah, isn't that? That's crazy. I, was, I, I really was surprised when I saw that name and I'm like, oh, maybe that's her daughter or something. But yeah, lo and behold. Wow. Yeah. So pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, so that's good my movie. last little tidbit I for love this it. one. Where can people find you, Andrew? People can find me over at uh, at at Soda Creek Film and on Twitter and on Facebook and they can always find me at rashpixel.tv slash MWL. That might very well be something different soon. That's I'm right. hoping. That's right. Find me at Pete Wright on the Twitter and uh, obviously at uh, rashpixel.tv slash MWL and uh, if you check us out on iTunes, we sure hope you will and when you get there, if you could, if you have a minute, and you have a couple of, fair, of, of spare stars, we would love a five-star review and a, a, a quick rating. And, and uh, let us know you uh, joined us for the show. We, we'd love your comments and, and um, uh, love to know that you shared the horror experience with us this month. Definitely, definitely. That's what I got. Thanks well, so hey, everybody. do me a favor, man. If I ever do get it and become a zombie, do me a favor and just shoot me. Oh, yeah. You can count on that. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> now now we have our ending. <laughs> Good night, Andrew. We have discussed so many fantastic movies on the next reel over the years. And Pete, I've got to say, I've been itching to revisit 2001 A Space Odyssey again. One of the all-time greats. Or maybe Moneyball instead, you know? But hold up, before you hit that rental button, check out the Next Reel's watch page. It's your one-stop shop for Apple and Amazon links to all the movies we've discussed in all 13 seasons of this show, including those we have yet to discuss in our current season. Wow, how convenient. So we can easily watch the movies that we rave about on the show using those links? Absolutely. Plus, by using those links to rent or purchase movies... Apple and Amazon show us a little bit of love, which allows you to support the show with minimal effort. Talk about a win-win. That's right. Head over to thenextreel.com slash watch. That's thenextreel.com slash watch to pick out your next movie and start watching today.